once again, you are very welcome to another episode of Centrum Guardians 2012, where we celebrate our emergency services personnel. They so seldom step into the limelight, but the work they do saves lives every day. We are looking for the Centrum Guardian of the Year 2012, and we are waiting on you to decide who will be awarded that title. Who inspires you to live life at 100%? Vote for that team or individual and make sure that they go through to the next round. In this episode, our guardians face truly exceptional challenges. How did this guy get in and he's still alive? The noise, the blood dripping. Yeah, that was horrible. Got plan A, plan B now failed. What must we do? Charles Sitole works at a packaging plant in Johannesburg. His cat is straight down. We go mix a lot of fire at the little monkey machine. His shift was coming to an end, an accidental knock, and the machine's powerful blades started to turn. The machine won't die. Yes, cat to round the one in a two hamba color. Yes, cat in two hamba, a moya wami wabu. In July last year, Hunters Hill Fire Station north of Johannesburg got a call from this packaging plant. When they arrived on the scene, they were confronted with something completely out of the ordinary. I think everybody didn't expect what we saw. I couldn't even myself believe that a person can go inside that machine. I couldn't believe it. This was to me, it, it was shocking. I was nervous. When I start to see him, I say myself, how did it happen? I saw his leg up, and then the one thing, the noise, the blood dripping, that, that, you know, it kept something. That, yeah, that was horrible. And then the leg as well, according to his body. So my, my thoughts were like, is he alive? Is the patient alive? The rescue workers had never seen anything like this before. At first, they were at a loss as to how to treat the trapped man. So, but then when you got there, you realized, uh, hectic, we need rescue. <laughs> this is a rescue, it's not just the patient. I got the call that there was a man trapped within a machine and that he was priority one. While waiting for backup from a specialist team, firefighters on the scene tried to reassure Charles. I said, we're here to help you. We want to free on this machine. It's just by said because it couldn't move. The crew improvised with what little equipment they had. It was very bad because from here is leg, here and here. Because that machine was pressing him. It's a small machine that was got some rotating to mix a soup. With limited access, the crew attempted to check Charles's condition and extricate him from the machine. They had managed to set up oxygen and a drip when backup arrived. I took it as was a normal industrial accident. I wasn't expecting too much until I arrived there. And then I saw um, what these guys were facing up to. And he literally had one of the blades that was running across his throat, directly across his throat in that position. One of his arms was literally mangled backwards and he had one of the blades literally just pushing it back onto his chest. And then he was also bent in that shape, in the U-shape, because the, the actual drum is a U. The crew was struggling to dismantle the machine. The outside of the skin of the machine was made of stainless steel. Uh, and also, again, it was formed, it was put into pressure. It was welded together. So again, you're sitting with a, with a machine that is made to, to last. 
we tried to force it, we even tried to um, lever it open, we even took a, a large 10 pound hammer, hammer and tried to knock it where we could. We tried all these little things just to see if we couldn't uh, loosen um, where it was basically now glued together. Then we realized, okay, this has failed, and we're gonna have to now try option two. They took a decision to cut the machine open. He was fairly mangled into the machine, but he was still conscious, he was still complaining of pain, he was talking to us. That changed the whole game plan. At that time, we also put protection over the patient. We just wet the container where the blade was, and we started to cut bit by bit. But that in itself was causing a, a, a huge amount of vibrations and, and stresses on the patient. The patient was receiving oxygen at that stage. The oxygen was causing more flammable uh, conditions. It's tense. You train 12 people and now this is another person that needs to be helped and quickly. And this is when our patient started to now basically scream in pain. So this was causing more tension amongst all of us now because now whatever we try and uh, we're causing pain to the patient. Because of the screaming, it's natural for you to want to stop. The crew pushed on. They knew it was his only hope. They knew time was running out. By my estimates, it was plus minus one hour, 30 minutes or two hours we're struggling to, to take him out, but we're looking someone in that pain and we don't do anything, it's useless. Rather cause the pain, but the patient to survive. Uh, just everything is, it is difficult. It is just extremely difficult. They were running out of options when suddenly they saw another possibility. Why don't you actually pull the mission down so that the patient can actually relax a bit to support him on that machine. They slowly and carefully tipped the machine onto its side. The movement traumatized Charles. I asked if there was a way that we could actually sedate him in a manner uh, to take him below consciousness. Using conscious sedation, they calmed the trapped man. We took him just low enough that his airway wasn't compromised too much, but that he wasn't conscious enough to remember what was happening to him. At this point, the crew had no idea of the extent of his injuries. We could see what was happening to the fracture of his arm, but for the rest of him, we couldn't really see what was happening internally. And we had to do it bit by bit. We had to guide, we had to watch where the blade was coming through, how far was the blade from the patient. They cut open the exterior and were left with a dangerous course of action. The first cut that we literally went for was for the, the cut across his throat. One tiny slip and it would all be over. Oh, that, that scene. <laughs> wow, that scene. And we actually literally went for the cuts, the major cuts, um, rapidly as to get his, his, his throat and his chest clear. You know, you feel that pain for him. You feel that pain and it, it was shocking. Firefighters, rescue specialists and paramedics were single-minded in their efforts to free Charles. The lovely part is I've, I've, I've never seen the guys just, just fighting so much, so hard for so long to just get to this patient. Very, very intense. Three hours of high pressure and Charles was finally safe. We were actually emotionally spent. I could see it on the crew's face, but by the time that we finished, the patient was on the stretcher, he was handed over to the advanced life support paramedics and he was on his way to hospital by helicopter. You could actually see that the guys just, it was as if they didn't have the power to just even make up their own equipment. That was how spent they were. I was sweating, I was tired. But the joy is, I save your life. Wow, I'm a lifesaver. I like saying that, that I'm a lifesaver. Because I'm a lifesaver. 
Mabenji, Naming Shing, and Yami Lupeg, and as Muguti and Zan. They had to hang in there for hours on end in spite of severe emotional stress in order to save a life. If this team inspires you to live life at 100%, vote for them now. SMS expertise to 33123. You can also vote online at www.centrumguardian.com. After the break, floods across the Lowfeld put hundreds of lives at risk. It was phenomenal. Um, the river was so huge. The weir actually looked like a rapid to me. It just a curtain of water. In that stage, there's so much adrenaline running you. Just go and do the work that needs to be done. You can't just leave a life just because you don't want to get hurt. On the 18th of January this year, half a meter of rain fell in the Lowfeld region in the space of 12 hours. At one point, the water was three meters above the Blyder River Dam wall. A total of 18 bridges were swept away. Hundreds of people were in distress, many of them quite literally hanging on for dear life. We dealt with, with previous floods within, within the Mopani district, but, but this one was, was absolutely uh, incredible. It's unbelievable the amount of water that we could see. In some cases you couldn't see five metres ahead of you. You know, stress started kicking in, but, uh, which is good. The scale of the torrents meant a coordinated plan had to be made, and fast. Uh, the houses look like it's breaking away underneath them, and get it top of the Personnel from ten different organisations combined resources to manage the disaster. The Air Force Base at Hutzpratt became another command center, coordinating incoming calls with available people and resources. So initially, as the calls came in, you didn't know how, what, what is the magnitude of, of the floods? You know, it's, it's, it's unbelievable if, if you receive information, people sit on a rooftop, um, people sit in, in treetops and then all that stuff. So this is priority number one, is life threatening, so we will send out an RX with Eagle. First of all, took all the priorities, a life threatening. Thereafter, we did all the necessary evacuations where people were stranded. Rescue 500, scramble, scramble, scramble now. The SAPS Air Wing scrambled their helicopter from the Nelstrait base. To help in, in such conditions, it's, it's a challenge. Eh? Their mission, to rescue a man clinging to life in raging waters. It's most probably the, uh, the highest risk work that you can do in a helicopter, is to do rescue operations. Colonel Henk Huttart piloted the helicopter. He had information that an emergency crew were at the scene, but were unable to reach the man. Yeah, the poor guy is hanging on for life and death. So we knew, listen, we should get in there as fast as possible and uh, as safe as possible. Kass's job was to guide Colonel Huttart into position. Because the pilot loses reference of where the person is at that stage, you take over control and you tell the pilot where you want the chopper to harbor and where to go. He constantly uh, needs to brief me on what's happening below the helicopter. I cannot see what's happening below. There was a strong wind from the west which threatened the operation. You have to have the helicopter perfectly stable. And perfectly positioned to complete a safe rescue. You should get your rescuer exactly down on the spot where the person is. Because if you miss either to, to the left or to the right, your rescuer is going to go downstream. Kass had one shot at hoisting rescuer Dani Tron into the turbulent river. I was attached to the hook on the side. Dani went over the side, putting his weight into the hoist and his life in teammate Kass's hands. Yes, that's, uh, that's amazing. Uh, it's, you just start focusing on your job at hand. Uh. The first time, it is always an adrenaline rush. The uncertainty hanging on a very thin cable beneath a chopper over open water is very scary, uh, but you end up trusting in your equipment and trusting in the ability of the chopper pilot and the hoist operator. Cuss lowered Dani just meters from the man. Colonel Huttart held the helicopter stable in gusting winds while Dani strapped the man to the hoist. 
I signaled to Cas that we are ready to go and they started lifting off. I put my arms around him and I also put my legs around him as soon as we start lifting up. I could feel the weight doubling and you know you could just feel that voice like going like stuff and you know listen great the person is on there. The nicest part of it is going up uh, then you know it's successful. I was in an operational center and, and you receive information from rescue operations taking place. You, you start to coordinate and the next moment you, you receive information that rescue is completed, that rescue is completed. It gives you a hard, warming feeling, but, but you, you cannot explain it. Colonel Goodhart and Cus were ordered back to base. Well, I told him, Cus, great job, sir. thanks very much, sir. Ah, it's the best words ever. When your pilot tells you, great job, you know, you're so relieved. The Joint Operations Centre in Hutzbrecht was fielding a volley of calls. So we were handling, as per incident came in, we were handling them. An urgent call came in from a group of tourists at a game lodge. Hard to believe that this is actually a road and not a river. All routes to the lodge cut off by the flats. Many of the roads were actually washed away, unbeknown to us. Natural instinct is to try and get around. Off-road rescue and ER24 cut through Big Five territory to reach the stranded tourists. There were actually lion tracks right next to the road where we were working. Being unarmed and so on, it's one of those things, it's a risk we took. At one point, the team was less than a kilometre from the trapped tourists. But we couldn't cross those rivers to get there. We tried about seven different routes, um, which was very frustrating because as you get to a road, um, it was all just washed away. There's no other crossing downstream either. I mean, we keep in contact with these people all the time, and they're expecting you to arrive at any moment. We are a kilometer away, we keep telling them. And then a huge insurmountable object or obstacle comes in the way. So we need to find another way. I think that is where the, the teamwork comes in. SAPS Airwing stood by as the off-road rescue team worked into the night to find a way through. We went right through till four o'clock the next morning, trying different routes to get to the people. And by that time we knew that, I mean, we couldn't get to them. By that time, the weather had cleared sufficiently to fly in and airlift the tourists to safety. We brought them in and we did a, a medical checkup with all of them. And then we would fund the health center and inform them that the next helicopter is coming in. It's really stunning, you know, um, you, you, you make a phone call and, and people are there. Joint Operations Center received an urgent phone call from a couple who had been stranded on a rooftop for six hours. We were worried. At one stage I was actually dangling my feet and it touched the water. Rescue helicopters were grounded in the driving rain. I don't know if it's the cold or the fear or the shock, but you become very calm. I don't know if it is because we are going to be rescued or if it's just me making peace with, with death. Skies suddenly cleared and Squadron 19 was given the go-ahead to do the lift. As we approached, we, there was water. I know the river's there and it was phenomenal. The water was about two feet from their feet and they were sitting on, on the roof of uh, the house. They had been stuck there for apparently about six hours. So you don't know how long would you be able to sit on this roof still until the, the water reaches you? When we arrived on scene, um, we realized if we were 20 to 30 minutes late, that it would have been a total different story. Uh, I think the water by then would have definitely caught up with him and took them down the river. We saw him coming up towards us. I actually had to hold on because the wind is, try is, is blowing me away from where I was sitting. This is now the real thing, and uh, these people's lives depend on what you need to do now. Pilot Henk Peterson held the chopper stable, while Rory Lawson went out on the hoist. By that stage, I think my body already went into shock, because then I started just shaking, and I just wanted to get out of there. And it was fast. Once you're in that helicopter, it's such a relief. But then you know, I am now safe. I'm going home. When I turned and I saw the two together and how they were holding on to each other, and there was still a lot of fear in their eyes, but there was also this relief, and they were both smiling at me. 
and you suddenly realize, ah, at least you've just done your job and you've, you know, got them together, you feel like you're doing what you paid for. En route back to Hoodspray Medical Center, they spotted an overturned car and went in to take a closer look. As we moved in and I was looking at the vehicles, one of the guys, I think it was Vince, actually said there's people in the trees. Two women and a baby were trapped in the trees. We went around and went into the hover. Once again, Rory was lowered on the hoist. He quickly reached the first woman. And I pulled in the cable three times to let Vince know it's he must winch. And as I did that, I said, Waza! And she, and she jumped. And I mean, that is heroic. And she just jumped straight from behind the tree and into my arms and, and Vince, Vince got us out of there. The terrified woman told them her baby and her sister were still in the water below. Rory immediately went out again. And as I touched the water, it took me straight against the tree. While the crew battled to extract Rory, Hoodsprite was dealing with a slew of victims. We always say that we have to observe, orientate, decide and act. We had to go through that continuously for 52 um, incidences that was recorded. Over 60 injured people were treated and more than 300 were evacuated. One of them was Sergeant Rory Lawson, who had been knocked unconscious mid-rescue. He was not really responding all that well. I said to him, Rory, I'm here. And then he just said slowly, he said, where are they? The woman and child had been left in the raging waters, the team now helpless to save them. I was really hoping that we didn't lose them. I actually became really emotional about the fact that I couldn't rescue them. Rory had fractured three ribs. And when he was taken to the hospital, we climbed onto the helicopter to assist with the search and rescue. Rescue technician Eugene Schreiber joined Squadron 19 to search for the two. And we looked all over at first, we couldn't see anything. And then at the end, when he went down himself, he saw them. And as I tried to reach her, I lost my footing and I was hanging on a small piece of branch. And I decided there's not only one chance we're going to get to get this mother out. So I grabbed her one arm with my hand and I pulled her off the tree on top of me. And there we waited for the helicopter to come to hoist us out of the water. Eugene and the team hoisted the woman and child to safety. And it wasn't even half an hour later and the mother, the child and the aunt came into the ward just to say they are fine and that was so amazing. It was, it was such an emotional time. The mother and child were reunited. It gives me goosebumps when I speak about my people of Air Force Base Hoodspray and, and the type of support that they've rendered. Despite the scale of the floods, only two lives were lost. This is, this is what, what makes the whole operation so ex excellent. Like a well-oiled machine running smoothly and uh, there were no hiccups. If you think this coordinated team deserves the title of Centrum Guardian of the Year, vote for them now. SMS the word teamwork to the number on your screen or go to www.centrumguardian.com. Both stories in this episode underlined the way in which the people in the emergency services, the SAPS and the Air Force form a web of support for each other and for us, the people they are there to help.